Welcome, Facebook. Well, I'm sorry, Facebook, YouTube, friends, and family. Um, I am Tiffany King. I'm an associate professor at Georgia State University, and I will be moderating this conversation, the artistry of Black organizing. And first, I'd like to thank Haymarket Books for sponsoring this event and providing the platform, and also being willing to share their donations, the donations that you make to Sister Songs, Southerners on the Ground, and Solutions Not Punishments. You can actually find the link for donating in the live chat, right? So um, before we start, I do want to do some housekeeping stuff for folks who are viewing. You can actually um, access the uh, closed captioning feature for this video. If you go to the bottom of your video, on the right-hand corner, there's a CC button. So press that and live captioning is being done by nearby. So thank you so much for that. Another thing, if you're having some issues with streaming, you might want to um, reduce your image quality. And if that doesn't work, leave the YouTube channel and then try to come back in. That's also something. Also, the chat will be moderated. It is a live chat. So be mindful of how you talk and how you speak. And we will try to take some questions towards the end of our conversation. Um, additionally, look out for some of Haymarket's upcoming events. I know that the next one is Voices from the Frontline. So we'll be talking with healthcare workers about the fight against COVID. That's another thing coming up. And then I think that's about it. So what I would actually like to do is introduce our three formidable organizers coming out of Atlanta. And I'm going to start with uh, Mary Hooks. So Mary Hooks is the co-director of Southerners on the Ground Song. Song is a political home for LGBTQ liberation across all lines of race, class, abilities, age, culture, gender, and sexuality in the South. Mary's commitment to Black liberation, which encompasses the liberation of LGBT folks, is rooted in her experiences growing up under the impacts of the war on drugs. Her people are migrants of the Great Migration. Faculty workers, I'm sorry, factory workers, church folks, Black women, hustlers and addicts, dykes, studs, femmes, queens, and all people fighting for the liberation of oppressed people. And we also have Monica Simpson, who is the executive director of Sister Song, the National Women of Color Reproductive Justice Coalition, or Collective, rather. And it's based in the historic West End in Atlanta and founded in 1997. Sister Song amplifies and strengthens the collective voices of indigenous women and women of color and ensures reproductive justice through securing human rights. Sister Song's headquarters is known as the Mother House and is a national organizing center for feminists of color. And Monica Simpson didn't add this is also an incredible artist with an, with an album called Revolutionary Love. So please check that out. And finally, uh, Tony Michelle Williams is a community organizer and advocate for black trans justice and liberation. <laughs> she serves as the leadership development and programs coordinator for the Solutions Not Punishment Coalition in Atlanta, Georgia. With SNAPCO, she successfully launched the Trans Leadership Connection Internship Program TLC in 2015. In 2016, the program released The Most Dangerous Thing Out Here is the Police, a report on trans people's experiences with, with the Atlanta Police Department. Hey, fam, I'm going to try to contain my giggling. These are some silly folks who I love. So <laughs> let's get into it. I have actually been wanting to talk to you all for a really long time. I mean, even before the pandemic. Um, but since the pandemic has brought us together, right at the a conjunction with a, a national and international rebellion, it's a perfect time to talk to y'all again. And really the first reason why I wanted to talk to you is because when I've been in spaces with you as organizers and some other folks, I mean, I've, I've been humbled and I've said to myself, wow, these folks are virtuosos who have a real commitment to, to serving um, liberation and black liberation and the movement on an everyday ongoing basis. And you treat it like a craft. So I really wanted to honor that and the other organizers who are doing this work. And particularly for new folks who are new to movement work or folks who wanna dive in deeper, 
I think it's really important for them to know about the years and years and years of work, um, particularly the, the base building work that folks do in order to even make it possible for people in the streets to articulate abolitionist demands like defund the police, right? The work has been going on a long time and it's often hidden. And then I also have really um, learned a lot from disability justice folks and healing justice organizers who've been doing this critical mutual aid work and creating new networks and communities of care that really um, are designed to take care of us in ways that anti-Black state structures and even some nonprofit structures can't do. So the mutual work and the invisible work that they're doing is helping us actually build a new world. And it doesn't get that same shine, right? That the folks who are in the streets where the television cameras are on them get. So I thought this would be really helpful if we could look at organizing in a really expansive way so people knew about all the myriad ways that they could plug in, right? So to get into the meat of the discussion and ground us, I wanted to start with a question for each of you. Um, how is it that you came to this work? Why are you an organizer? And anyone can start. I can start us off. Yay! <laughs> um, so, um, hey everybody, thank you so much for having me, uh, Tiffany, and so happy to share space with all of these brilliant, amazing Black people, honey. I love them all so much. and. We're going to be giggling all the way through, so please have grace with me because I'm a giggler. <laughs> um, but I started in this work uh, about 10 years ago um, as I was organizing um, on campus at my HBCU, Norfolk State University. Um, I had experienced some violence in the dorms. Um, as a Black trans woman, I was put into a dormitory with a whole bunch of cis men um, who did not understand my light um, and oftentimes put me in places of, of tr like deep discomfort and distrust of my people. Um, and I knew that, you know, I had power. I was paying money to be there. And I was like, honey, I need some changes to happen. And I organized some friends <laughs> around um, to stand with me um, as we were like demanding that we were placed in dormitories that were, you know, that felt good to our spirits and that were affirming to our experiences um, and that there were protocols and accountability measures uh, for particularly young black men um, who were just wilding out, you know, at the age of 18 and 19. Um, and I've stuck with it since. Um, and about three years later, I found uh, my girls, Black trans women, a community of Black trans women who uh, were engaging in sex work at the time in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, who understood my vision of who I was. Uh, they listened to me and saw Toni Michelle as clear as I saw her. Um, and supported me um, in my transition and development. Um, and so I committed myself to my girls, uh, to the liberation and freedom of and self-determination of Black trans women and Black trans people across this country. Um, and when I moved to Atlanta, I found family with the Solutions Not Punishment Collaborative, family with Song and Mary and all of the other folks like Monica, Miss Cheryl, Courtney Evans, and uh, just so many folks. Um, in Atlanta um, that showed me movement um, and invited me in that work with them. And so I've been co-leading that uh, with all of those brilliant, beautiful folks since then. Um, you're about to go, I can go. You better go. <laughs> Peace, everybody. Um, thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Haymarket Books. This is really beautiful and amazing to share this space with two beautiful folks that I have so much love and respect for, Tony Michelle and Mary. But let me tell you what brings me to this work. You know, I would first have to say that I'm a black woman born of a black woman in the South. And that by <laughs> um, that pure nature of being that black woman born of that powerful black woman made me an organizer. I just truly believe that. 
um, because I saw my mother and my grandmother and the women in my community um, take care of our community and take care of each other in such a powerful way. And that was my first introduction to what organizing um, really meant for me. Um, I grew up in rural North Carolina and um, I am also a product of the black church. And it was in that space that I learned um, that I had a voice, but I also learned about sexism and patriarchy. Didn't have the words for that, but I had a lot of questions around how that showed up in that space um, and was constantly questioning <laughs> those around me as to why women couldn't speak from the pulpit or why people were being shamed for um, having children before they were graduating high school or even if they were having children if they weren't married. Um, and I just saw that that shaming happens so early and it really starts to shape my analysis around sexual and reproductive health in a very particular kind of way. Um, I'm also a product of the HBCU world and went to um, Johnson C. Smith University where I came out. And that's where my organizing really started in a lot of ways. Um, and you know, also growing up in the rural South and experiencing the over-policing of my community, um, and the violence that we had to deal with, I brought that with me to my college life, right? And, and just really started to move in those arenas. But when I came out, it seemed as if I had to take a different turn in my organizing. And um, that was really a huge, uh, just entry point for me into organizing in a different kind of way because it was so much more personal. It was my life that I was talking about, not the people that were in my community or my family members, the folks that I loved. It was actually me that I was having to advocate for and speak on behalf of. And, you know, I also did a lot of work in the club scene. You know, I think that, you know, as a party promoter and as a person who did a lot of work around that, that my organizing came from that, being in the club world and the party world and creating safe spaces for folks to be able to enjoy one another, but also see the transformation that happened in those spaces absolutely um, impacted the way that I showed up in as an organizer and in the work that I do. Um, and... You know, all of that, I feel like, were those those different parts of my journey led me um, to this work of reproductive justice, where I get to talk about sexual and reproductive health and my reproductive rights um, every single day and advocate and organize around those issues. Again, knowing that I grew up in a place where we didn't have access to comprehensive sex education, and that took me down a very interesting um, journey of my own sexual um, life as a young person, um, enduring sexual assault, and all of that. So all of those things come together to really create who I am as an organizer, and again, all of those things led me to this work of reproductive justice. My, my, my. Mm, mm, mm. Well, I stand in amazement, beloveds, for the journey that y'all have um, that y'all have made to uh, be in movement and to be right here in my little computer <laughs> in in this moment, um, and to be able to share space with y'all, comrades. So it's good to see y'all. Um, I see. I got into work. I'm trying to. Um, uh, I often say that um, my first organizing was inside of the the Black Culture Church organizing for white Jesus as a teenager who, you know, entered into the church. I think I was like 14 when I entered to the church and I, but in my mind, I was like 24 because I grew up real fast given the conditions of my life. And I remember uh, going into church thinking that this is going to be the thing that like helps my family, helps me help my people like get through the mess of uh, the war on drugs and the crack epidemic. And, um, you know, just like living paycheck to paycheck, struggling and surviving. And, um, and you know, cause I grew up thinking that it was our fault that, you know, we were just making bad decisions or we just, you know, I didn't have a, a an analysis and understanding that there was folk who had made decisions even before I was born. And those like Reagan, who was president when I was born, we're making big decisions that was causing uh, massive problems. Um, fast forward, uh, went through church, and I think, well, inside of church is where I think I learned, um, and the, the mothers of the church would teach me how to minister to people and not be afraid to look folk in the eye and to talk to spirit, you know? And, you know, I would be like, and I was a serious, like, I was serious about it. I wasn't like one of these church babies that was playing games with the Lord. I had my own prayer life. I was a fasting sister. I was serious about my walk with the Lord. 
um, in organizing for white Jesus. And then um, I remember I uh, got a, a scholarship to go to uh, this white Lutheran school, college, um, full ride scholarship. And the first, I believe it was like the first or second day on campus, I saw this black woman and that shit changed my life. I saw her walk down the hall, son, and I was like, my God, the blood, the blood right now. I knew that it was going to be a game changer for my whole life. Oh, my God. And by the end of my freshman year, we had entered into a relationship and um, the church folk began to find out and all things, all hell broke loose, to say the least, to say the least. And um, by the time I got into my sophomore year, um, I lost my, my scholarship. My life was falling apart, deeply suicidal, like just whew, in a bad way. And 9-11 happened. And all these things began to happen in the world that I didn't have language for and understanding of why it was happening. Um, you know, market crash, you know what I'm saying? I take up a gig. I was, was a waitress and started like working for the Olive Garden. I do know how to make the um, Zupa Toscana. Um, you know what I mean? I would be cooking and stuff at the Olive Garden, serving up them hot plates, um, slanging them breadsticks. But eventually, after working in like, um, you know, Olive Garden, gas station, whatever, um, I moved to Atlanta about 13 years ago. And um, with my mind on, I'm going to go here, I'm going to get my degree, I was going to get a bachelor's degree, I'm um, eventually work for the EEOC. Because I knew I was feeling injustice, bad stuff was happening to me at work. And I was like, this is the way you tackle it. And I remember um, uh, Katrina happened. And I was, I remember seeing what was playing out. And everything in me wanted to go and, like, be of service, to, to do something. And I remember um, at the time the gig was like, no, nah, you can't go nowhere. You know what I mean? I was on the plantation, you know what I'm saying? And... Um, I was like, I never, I don't ever want to be in a position where I felt this this call to move for my people and came. And um, uh, this is maybe a few years later, circa 2008, I believe that was. Uh, I went out clubbing one night. Monica, I want to, you, no, you weren't, we hadn't met yet. I think we may have went maybe a few weeks later. But I was out clubbing with my homies, checking out the ladies. Hey. And um, my homie Angela saw Tenderoni. Was like Mary, go holler at her. I was being the wingman that night, and um, uh, as I was talking to this woman, I asked her. I said, "What do you do? Like, what you do? You know what I mean?" And she was like, "I'm trying to stop the shackling of black women while giving birth in prison." What? 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 And that right there, yo, I was like, "That's happening, and you doing something about it?" Like that's that's the part I think that I. I Lord have mercy. When I tell y'all I was like a blank slate beside my own life experience. I didn't, I didn't get politicized to the cabinet. I didn't like, I had, I was just like, what? Like I didn't know nothing. You know what I mean? But we all became homies. And then um, I would ask her and ask her like, what do you mean? Tell me, I don't understand. Like there's people that are organizing. What is that? And that's when she was like, I'm gonna introduce you to my political home. And that's when she introduced me to Song. And Song was doing a, um, like a uh, six month, like social justice one-on-one -on -one type sitch here in Atlanta. And I remember back then it was like BT, uh, Juan Evans, K. Shapiro, a bunch of us, a bunch of us just like up in it. And this was before the social forum was happening. People kept saying social forum. I was like, what is that in Detroit? I was like, literally y'all, they was probably like this little diggy. But anyway, um, but I stuck with it. I stuck with it and song um, gave me an assignment to go to Alabama and find queer and trans people and find out what was happening, what was the conditions and what were people willing to do about it. And by the time 2013 came on, um, I joined the organization full time. I mean, I was joined as a member, but like I came on full time and y'all just been like grinding on assignment, you know? Yeah. Y'all, thank you for that. I don't think I've ever heard those stories. I could literally talk about y'all's origin stories all day. Mm -hmm. but no, I mean, thank you for lifting up the spaces that produced um, you as an organizer. You gave me a sense of also like some of the passions and skill sets that you have that you're bringing into movement work, right? And it's just helpful for people to know that 
you weren't always this organizer, right? It started at some point and you became who you are. So people can jump in, right? So the next thing I wanted to ask you all is what is organizing? How do you define it? Alrighty, friends, I'm gonna I'm go ahead. And I think it'd be cool to like build out, out a definition, but yeah. essentially the way I've understood and learned organizing is that organizing, uh, community organizing is um, the, uh, the work of bringing everyday people together to understand our conditions, to be able to confront power, uh, to build power in order to confront power in order to create the conditions whereby we can have shared power and change power relationships inside of our community that shifts the material conditions of our lives. But I also want to name two, um, you know, in this, it, it's several things that come inside of it, right? It's the popular and political education. It's the, um, the cultural uh, work that happens inside of organizing. It's, um, um, the different methodologies and, and tactics and, you know, strategies, campaigns, and you know what I mean? There's much that comes inside of it, but community organizing essentially just allows, yeah, everyday people to like discover what we can do together to change a problem we all have together. And I think that there's this piece around the material conditions part, particularly in this late stage of, of capitalism and neoliberalism, I get a little like, I know it's about the material conditions, but I'm also feel like organizing is calling us to do, uh, to change the spiritual conditions, to change spiritual conditions as well. And I, um, and so I feel like it's a huge balance. And I feel like if we engage in community organizing that's transformative, that it does change the spiritual conditions of individuals and the folk who engage and are impacted by the work that communities do together. Yeah. And I would just add, it's about meeting people where they are, right? And being able to help people understand that their stories, their experiences are sacred. And that speaks to what Mary was just saying around like the spiritual, changing the spiritual conditions of folks. It's about understanding that we all have a story to tell. We've all been impacted by these various, you know, isms and many layers of oppression and all the things, you know, that come on us, right? And that are put on us in our communities. And so it's about meeting people where they are and helping them understand that their stories, what what they've endured, what they are currently facing, it is all sacred and important um, and helping them understand and give them the language, the political education, the tools to be able to advocate on behalf of themselves, right? Um, to be able to move in the ways that they need to for themselves, their families, their communities. I don't really have anything to add after that. <laughs> um, but, um, but honestly, I, you know, Mary, when Mary was talking um, in our first round, you know, what stood out to me was something about, you know, you having the calling, like, to move for your people. And it is, it, it's also, you know, as an organizer, just thinking through, um, you know, what it means to really truly hold, like, a safe container for people to experience that kind of belonging. Um, and like, and trust that that like deep spiritual work is available to them, um, I think is real is a part of like the culture of organizing our people, black people. Oh, thank you for that. That's that's real helpful, real helpful for me, and I'm sure other folks. Um, as you all have grown over the years as organizers, like what is a muscle you say you developed or a skill you developed, right? You have particular approaches, but what's, what's the thing where you can kind of flex, right? <laughs> what's that thing that you really leaned into and worked on? Yes, I could start us off. For me, honey, it's this thing called supernatural grace. Mm, 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 mm. Hallelujah, Jesus. Black Jesus woman teased 
trans tees. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, supernatural grace. Um, first learning um, to build that muscle, like, you know, inside of myself. Like, how do I have grace and empathy and understanding of the things that I go through, the things that I take myself through, the things that I've been taken through, and how to also have that, you know, for other people as we are meeting people where they are, like Monica said, as we are, you know, responding to this calling, you know, it's like everyone's not going to understand that calling. Everybody's not going to be impacted by that calling and in, in the clear vision that you have heard God or, you know, however you've come into the work or to organizing. It's like, you know, how are you having grace for that? And how, and how are you having grace for people's process of transformation? Um, and uh, that's definitely a muscle that I have uh, grown, like learned, uh, particularly with my own family. Um, and I think that's one of my, my biggest approaches to how I model grace. It's like how I organize my family, how I share the political things that I know with them, how I model being present um, and extending love, you know, and connection in moments where they don't deserve it. You know, it's like, how do I really embody that type of grace for people as I'm holding the container and space for us to be transformed on the other side, you know? Um, yeah. I honestly would just have to echo what my niece just said. Like, I mean, <laughs> who that muscle of grace, baby, that has shown up in so many ways. Um, I have now been organizing for close to 20 years, um, which sounds crazy coming out of my mouth, but <laughs> it's the truth, you know? Um, and whenever I first started organizing, I was ready to run full force, head first, you know, into everything. And I would just like barrel through like all the things because I felt like I had to, you know, be the loudest or make the biggest statement or, you know, say the thing first or whatever that was. Like, I felt like I had to move at the speed of light and just be ready, you know, to go. And I still hold on to that because it's important to stand in your power, to understand who you are and like what you bring to a space. But just being able to, to have that, that sense of grace and, to take breath and to take pause when necessary, to be able to allow everyone to be able to be seen and heard and, you know, to also take into consideration what people are bringing, what, how folks are stepping into it. Like all of that is so necessary. And, I'm, and, and as a leader in this work now from moving from like organizer and I'm still an organizer, even though I'm a leader, but there's, there, there's been this, this, this shift as, as in being a leader where now my role is to make sure that I am creating space for new folks and new voices to come into spaces, right? And so I've had to really do that delicate dance of stepping forward, but also stepping back, right? Um, which has been different for me. Like I, I, I've just had to learn that over these past couple of years of like, what does that look like? And I think that I've tried to do that the best way that I could, but I think that that's something I've had to really build my muscle in as a leader is in how do I create the space in the container, right? For folks to be able to come in and to give them the, the skills, the, to give them access to what they need to be able to grow into being their best self. And so I felt that shift in my organizing journey to be able to do that as well. And I think that I've been building up my muscles around doing that well, and I'm learning every day how to do it better, right? But so I would add that. Delish, delish. Um, I think that um, a concrete skill, I think about um, the work of coordinating people, like wrangling mother people in. <laughs> the wrangle, the wrangle, the, the come on, the widening of the circle, the calling folk back, the hey, you said you was going to do a thing, is you going to do a thing. Like that, that work of, of keeping people engaged and watching for the margins and who ain't showed up in a while and who like that work there is something that um, I had to learn because, you know, ain't nobody doing turnout calls for the church. Folks know churches at six, 
you be there at six. Ain't no turnout calls happening. People show up because you believe in the thing, you you get what you do. And at some point, I think people, you know, develop the discipline where you don't have to be wrangled. You're like, oh, you know, such and such. But as people are coming in, you mean where people are at? Like that that work of, of yeah, organizing and bringing people in and uh, being able to, like, monitor different pieces of work and delegate and to, you know, build an atmosphere where everyone believes in collective work, you know, because as the African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, you damn sure better go together. And that is the work of organizing is getting folk to go together. Um, and I think that, you know, among so many things, I remember I was looking at some old, um, old notes from like, some of like the earlier uh, song meetings that I was in and like um, it was showing like everybody doing their go around and check in and how's the work and woo-woo. I think I had like a sentence and a half of like, everything is fine. We are having challenges. It was real like, because I feel like for maybe a year or so when I, when I like really started going hard in the work, I barely spoke in meetings. I was so self-conscious. I was so like, am I understanding this? correctly and then somebody would say it in the room and I'm like oh yep you was thinking about it right and it took me a while to develop the confidence to to name what I understood to be able to bring forth suggestions and it's not like the you know it wasn't like an intimidating space per se but it was like I knew that I was like I'm new and just getting you know my feet wet but I also um you know I also think that what what I feel was important in that time now and in, in, in hindsight, I'm like, I think it is important to be able to sit and listen and to sit, listen and to learn and to like, you know, like sit, settle into what has been here before you got here. You know what I'm saying? Because this shit didn't pop off just because I came because somebody found me like, no, folks been organizing. So how do you honor that and take notes? I was a note taking. You know what I mean? Um and being able to listen and be able to learn and to just store information. And I think my ability to, um, and, and being like actively uh, studying, actively studying in an in application. And not just reading for the sake of reading because you're like, oh, I'm gonna just be, have all this knowledge, but like studying those things that, um, you know, I would like, I didn't know something like, let me ask somebody that includes study as well as picking up material resources to like, help me figure this out. Let me learn, ask other folks, how did y'all do this? Let me see it. Let me see an old agenda you ran. You know what I mean? And realizing that this is what also makes movement movement and not a business. Like nothing is copywritten. You honor folks' labor, of course. Always honor the brilliance and work that folk have done, but always um, be generous in the way in which we give and share and provide, you know, um, examples of work or whatever that can help us, um, you know, figure out how to get north, you know? So that was something too that, um, I feel like, uh, have helped me learn and to sharpen. Yeah. It's always super grateful for the, uh, the generosity of spirit that folks have been to pour into all the, as, uh, Wendy O'Neill says, all the ashes mm. that have come and spoken into you. I am made up of a many, many ashes. So, yeah. Thank you. I mean, with given that you all have spoken so much about supernatural grace and spirituality, right? I, I'm going to skip a next question that I had in mind about some things that you felt you needed to work on or that you were still kind of struggling with. And maybe we can talk about that later. Yeah, but I do you want to talk about that. <laughs> But I do want to uplift some things that I have experienced sharing spaces with you all that have been profound moments for me where I could see you all leaning into grace, right? And doing things on multiple levels, spiritual, material, um, metaphysical, that blew my mind, right? So for instance, I'm going to start with um, Monica. I think the first week that I arrived in Atlanta, I made sure to touch base with Sister Song because I knew stuff was popping. I'd heard of y'all through Insight and other work that I was doing. And at that meeting, I ran into Mary Hooks. I ran into Holiday, reconnected um, with them. And you actually 
opened up the possibility to folks in the room, or at least for me, that I could bring my full self to the movement. That things that I uh, was really passionate about, the reproductive justice movement and the larger liberation movement could shape itself around those things that we bring. Like, how did that become a part of your philosophy? Um, tell us about that a little bit. You know, I, I tell people all the time that, you know, I felt like the reproductive justice movement found me. It like tapped me on the shoulder and was like, yeah, this is, this is your home. This is where you need to be. Um, and that understanding of like bringing my whole self really didn't come to me from any other movement space that I had been in, to be quite honest, until I came to reproductive justice and was under the leadership of folks like Loretta Ross and Tony Bond. And these black women were very clear that you can't do this work, you know, only bringing parts of yourself to this table. Um, and we're not gonna get to liberation without you bringing your full self to the work. Um, and I had been conditioned in so many other spaces to only talk about one aspect of my life or to only, you know, organize around one aspect or I, I had been like conditioned over the years to like really focus in on like one particular pathway. Um, and reproductive justice completely shattered that for me. Um, I came to a table and I'm thinking that we're going to be talking about contraception and, you know, <laughs> you know, access to, you know, healthcare services or all the different things that I was really excited about in RJ. And these black women asked me, so where'd you come from, though? And what is your story? And who are you? And what has what have you endured? What have you overcome? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, you, you, you're you asking me to bring all this to the table? And they're like, absolutely, because that's where your power is. Right. Those whatever it is that you've overcome, what you what you've had to face, all of that, that's where your power lies. And you can't just come to this work and disregard your story and disregard what you have triumphed over, what you have, you know, put what, what you've gone through. And I was taught that you didn't talk about those things. Right. That you kept those things to yourself and that, you know, yeah, you went through them, but you made it over. Now, you now go to work. And reproductive justice taught me that that actually is the work, right, um, of bringing all of that to the table. And so there were parts of my story that I didn't even realize that I had pushed way down and far away from myself um, just so I could do the work. And um, over these now 10 years that I've been with Sister Song, I have I've unearthed so many of those stories and so many of those experiences. I'm talking for the first time about sexual assault that I've experienced. I'm talking for the first time about my journey with, you know, my sexual journey, which absolutely led me to this work. I'm able to talk about those things and not feel shame around them or not to feel as if they make me any less powerful because I've endured these things. Um, and I saw the leadership before me and Sister Song model that in their own stories and, and standing in them in such power. And so now it's, it's impossible for me to think about movement work in whatever you know facet that I'm doing it in, without bringing all of myself to the table, and I think that, um, yeah, having that you know taught to me, you know, and in coming into Sister Song and coming into reproductive justice has made me a stronger leader. But it also helps me in doing this work um, in such a real kind of way, like the healing work that is so necessary in our work um, is is what. Is, is what, what, what that's, what, what's that, what is that, that's what's rooted in, that's what it's rooted in. And yeah, I, I, I couldn't do this any other way, but that's what it means to me when you get to bring your full self. I am bringing my body, I am bringing the experiences, I'm bringing, you know, my womb, I'm bringing all of it to the table and everything that I have endured, everything that I'm hoping for and thinking about and want to come to fruition, I'm bringing all of that to the table. You know, Audre Lorde tells us we can't have single issue movements because we don't have, we don't live single issue lives. And that's really what is the, the crux of that, right, um, for us in reproductive justice. So, yeah, it is, it, it is my political home, Sister Song is, but this movement has transformed my entire life because of that very notion of bringing my full self to the work. That's so important to hear for people who are you're brand new to the work or moving to different organizing spaces. That, that's a beautiful invitation for folks. That really is. Thank you. Um, I want to lift. Uh, something that I saw Tony Michelle do. So Tony Michelle, I'm on your 
Facebook Live a lot for some <laughs> words on cis het men and other topics. I'm on it. <laughs> I follow it dutifully. But one thing that you did make available um, was some footage from um, the direct action on June 13th after the murder of Rayshard Brooks, right? So when folks went out to shut down the downtown connector and on um, both sides of I-75 and I-85, you streamed some of that for us, right? And particularly um, stream the part where folks invited white allies to get on the line, right? And, and all of that, the work that that required. And so when you had your camera, you were able to document the ways that it was primarily you and another black organizer whose name I don't know were like engaged in this practice of a real, real deep presence with people who were about to put themselves in front of the police, um, in front of black um, organizers and folks out there. And just again, that's right, like your the supernatural grace that you talked about, I could really see it on display. Like you moved from person to person down the line and it's like, this is the bail situation. Here's your number so we can identify you. You checked in with people. Are you from here? Right? A person wasn't. You're like, you probably need to get off the line and go do something else. Have other work for you to do. Right? And it was just real, like, the trust building that you were doing. I have other questions about why white people don't already show up in formation ready because there's a lot of work you're doing. And we can talk about that later. But... Like the deep presence you have with people, it was like watching a sacred moment. It was like, we might all die. I know the cops came for you, right? So you're not safe, but you're in a deep space of like, look, I'm going to be present with you here, whatever happens. I can't guarantee you're going to make it out, but we can have kinship in this moment where you step up and put yourself in the proximity to death that Black people always experience. I was floored by that. I was like, this is not for play play. Like, this is serious. This is not a casual thing. This is something that you devote yourself to every day over and over and over again. And I don't I don't have a full picture of what that was, so I wasn't there with you. But I just wanted to give you that and hear you talk about that experience. Uh-huh. Yes. When you talk about it like that, you know, you just be like, damn, that's actually what was happening uh, <laughs> when you're in it you know, just trying to, you know, make sure people are okay. Um, But, yeah, that was a wild night. And for me, um, yeah, that was a wild night. Um, Again, like you said, it was right after, uh, it was not even a whole 24 hours after Rayshard Brooks was murdered. Um, And it was literally within the hour that the Wendy's had burned down. Hallelujah. Uh, and, um, and, you know, when myself and other organizers, uh, my friends and, um, my partner approached the, um, intersection, you know, you know, we saw everybody in formation. So just like you had your question, you was like, you know, why can't white folks be in formation? I was like, oh, the white folks are in formation. And when I got up there, though, nobody knew that they were in a formation. And nobody knew what they was in formation to do. And so um, so um, I really didn't know in that moment. I was like, ah, oh, OK, actually. Um, we're going to need these white people again. Um, and so how to not get them, you know, how, how to empower them to continue to show up, because uh, we are going to always need their bodies, right? So, um, honestly, because we're going to be under attack, right? So, um, yeah, that was a wild night. I think for me, the moment that I felt grace on me, um, and I think that that's like... Uh, That was one of the reasons why I approach this work with grace and approach people with so much grace is because, honey, I want some grace 
up on me, okay? So I want to treat people exactly how I want to be treated. Um, and literally in the moment, the you know, the picture that everyone saw of me being detained or about to be arrested, uh, for folks who didn't see, I was not arrested because this moment of grace happened. Um, but as he grabbed my arms and knocked out the megaphone and the, the phone out of my hand um, and started taking me to the ground, um, there were um, there were these other there were two other black there were three black, other black folks in the space um, who were not police officers um, and they were with me as I was rallying folks and wrangling folks together as I was talking and negotiating with police um, or the Georgia Highway Patrol um, and when I was as I was going down. Um, it was those two black cisgender heterosexual men that I didn't know from shit to lit, honey, um, that they literally picked me up and pulled me out of that situation and they put their bodies on the line for me, like this black trans woman, right? Um, in a way that I, I, had, I, I just never thought, I never thought that, that's, that that was possible for a girl like me, um, especially in a moment where uh, you know, other black folks are, are literally facing, like facing the man, like facing the white man. And it's like, you know, the white man has guns galore, has cars galore, right? Um, and these men still thought to pull me to safety with them, right? And um, that kind of grace, as a black trans woman in this time where so many of you know, my girls and other black trans people are experiencing so much violence at the hands of our people, right? You know, it was like, oh, actually, something supernatural is possible at all times. We just have to trust and be present for it, right? It's possible at all times. And so when we talk about reimagining uh, safety, you know, reimagining you know, um, a world without cages and a world we thrive. It's like, baby, all of that shit is possible at any time. At any time. We just have to, like, trust ourselves, trust that we're worthy to be protected, trust that, what, that we belong within the communities that are fighting alongside of us to really, truly get some satisfaction. And for me, satisfaction was living and making it through that moment, right? Being able, like my mama, I call my mama before, when every time there's an action, I call my mama, she lives in Lithonia and Decatur. And I'd be like, mama, I'm about to go do an action, honey. She'd be like, oh my God, you and Devin, y'all be careful. Cause I've been seeing y'all out there. I've been she, you know. So I always call her before action um, and tell her that I'm okay, but it was, that was satisfaction for me and those black men, whether they knew that I was trans or not, you know, I got feedback and some folks, you know, from community saying, oh, do you think they saved you because you were passable or They're like, oh, all of that shit, that don't matter. That don't matter. It matters and it don't matter. What matters is that in that moment, I and those men believed and trusted that we could save each other. And they moved. They had a calling to move, and they moved. And so I, I, there's something about, again, believing that you are worthy of that grace, that you're able to not respond to the calling, but make a calling yourself and make the request out loud that supernaturally, baby, somebody, God is going to move somebody and something somewhere, honey, to support you. That's all I got. Sorry, y'all. My mother, my <laughs> word. My <laughs> word. That's word. Now that's the word. No, more than. I'm my over here sweating. God came on it. The long <laughs> way. Come on now. That's how <laughs> That's powerful. That's powerful. Oh. Let me say this. First of all, Mary, the fact oh. that you are outside smoking a cigarette, you made our Haymarket conversation the living. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
I'm really appreciating this um, conversation about spirit. I was listening to um, this powerful organizer, um, Tasia Troutman, on, I think the show is on YouTube in the middle, and they were talking about protest space as sacred space. And I was like, that's exactly what is happening. Anything is possible, right? Anything is possible. And leaning into the sacred Mary, I have been in spaces and done um, the call and response for mandate, uh, the mandate for black lives with you and without you, right? I wanna know so much about it. Um, it's so important to do that um, in organizing spaces that we come into. So one, I wanna know if you could lead us in that, number one, and then also talk about how, to, how did that come into being? Like, what was the moment? Who were you working with? How do we arrive at actually having this um, call and response? So I think I'm gonna start with the I'm gonna start with the 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 why or the first the second half and then do it. Um, but I remember well one I'll start off by saying that song has been begging that question of are you willing to be transformed in the service of the work for years. That's kind of like the question that gets raised when things get hot and heavy, when we know that stakes are high, when, you know, like you're being, you know, called to do a thing that might make you uncomfortable or might make you like, you know, question like, damn it, do I want to keep doing this liberation work? Um, but it's been a resounding question, um, which grounds us in our commitment to our people and the work that we're called to do. Um, and again, connects again to um, being transformed in the service of the work, like knowing that we have to, um, we yes, we bring our full selves. And I often say that if you're doing organizing right, because we know that a lot of hurt people, we come into organizing with our wounds, with our traumas, all the things, our righteous anger. But if we're doing it right, something is going to begin shifting in our own lives. The person transformation um, that happens in the midst of like community work um, that allows us to be more gracious, that allows us to be uh, more merciful, that allows us to, you know, have more fun and not stop being so damn serious all the time. You know what I mean? Be able to, um, you know, um, um, you know, deal with conflict in a way that is uh, principled in the way in which we struggle and not just fighting to be right whack but we you know struggling to build unity um so that i'll uh i have to start there because that's what it's rooted in and i remember one night um i've been having many conversations with um a few, i remember that night in particular i i remember sitting in my couch sitting in my chair and i had a conversation with a comrade and i think we were talking about like um the role of ancestors in the work and it was a deep combo honey you know we had burned a little grain down and that's when Spears starts talking straight up and down. And I remember sitting in my, had my big book, was sitting in the chair and I said, this, this, this question we beg in song around being transformed in the service, transformed in the service of the work. I said, I, there is something there, but I think there is something else for black people. There was something else very specific to black people. And I feel like it was um, almost like clear as day. When I look at the old big book that it's in, and I was just like writing, writing my big book, like there's something else here for black people that we too have to grapple with. And we too have to understand as we struggle for liberation. And it, it felt clear as day, it felt clear as day. It's like, we are about avenging the suffering of our ancestors. Make no mistake about it. We ain't forgot, we ain't forgot. 400 years of what's been happening as kidnapped Africans in this country, still in our DNA, still, still in our DNA, ain't forgot, ain't forgot, ain't gonna forget it, ain't gonna get over it. Um, and, know, and knowing that um, it's been generations of, of oppression that has, you know, uh, that has created the conditions by which we fight in, um, in absence of, and not having that connection to history and that connection to our ancestry about um, the legacy of work that we um, are engaged in, right? Because we always been resisting, is it has to be like very clear, 
It has to be very clear. And I think it also helps put things in perspective, you know, around our, our current suffering. You know, it's all relative, of course, but it also just like reminds of us of, of whose um, who's sacrifices, whose blood, whose who's work, whose labor, whose, you know, um, grief, um, whose freedom dreams are we, you know, have to harvest. And then the earning of respect to future generations. And it, I remember thinking about Sankofa and that, um, you know, that, that understanding that when we make decisions or when we think about what, what are we to do right now, that we must think about the seven generations that have come before us and the seven generations that will come after us, right? And so we know that it's not just, um, you know, what we do right now. That's why I get I get a little trapped up about changing the material conditions because I'm like, yes, and yes, and there has to be something to that. Uh, we know that we are seed planters. We know that, you know, when history will be told to to our people, our, our next generations that will come about, they need to see um, they need to see us having struggled um, in a way that, you know, has gifted them, you know, they're the map to this is where we were headed. This is where we were going. This is the way we were thinking and not to, and do it in a way that is liberatory liberation, every step that it can't just, um, you know, the, the ends can't justify the means, you know what I mean? No, the means have to be liberatory if we're going to get toward liberation. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and I think that the piece around, yeah, like again, the, the, and, um, being transformed, being transformed, that part right there. I remember when um, a lot of the conversation around self-care, you know, began to, you know, become more popularized in movement. And I was so frustrated. I was so frustrated because I was like, oh, why is they talking about it like this? Yeah. It's about, I'm like, yes, I get like on the like real, like, yo, take a break. You know what I mean? Do you. So, do, you know what I mean? To, to fortify yourself. But I also thought it's also about doing self-work. It's about the self-work. As Elijah Van Zandt say, unplug your triggers. You know what I'm saying? Like that is the work you have to do. Because we don't ask us to show up and be perfect, but we must come and bring our best selves. And um, there's a, a conversation that Paulina Helm Hernandez, who was one of the former co-directors of Song um, on the Fortification podcast, she was talking about her and Caitlin Breelove, who was also a former co-director, was having a conversation. And one of the things that Paulina, um, that they were talking about, they were saying like, you know, at some point they had to tell each other that if you don't get your life, if you don't align your life in a way that allows you to engage in movement, you will never be able to do the work you've been called to do because your life is so messy. You full of drama, you make bad decisions. <laughs> Like, ugh, stop doing that. So your life can be situated in a way where you can be in service without all the mess, all the cloud, all the extra stuff, you know, all your traumas, you know? And I think that, um, so that's what that, that's what that, that's what I'm holding. Every time I think about it, every time I say it. Um, and it's interesting, sometimes when I hear it, I've been in places and spaces where people play it. And I'm, I'm like, that's my voice. But sometimes I'm like, I just feel, I'm like, what that is? We, I don't know. If I see it, I have to close my eyes. It's, a, it's an interesting um, way in which I um, relate to when I hear it, you know? It's, so, <laughs> it's interesting. But, um, but yeah, and this is for black people. So if you're white and you're watching, you can't say this. Just to be clear. <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> But um, the mandate for black people in this time is to avenge the suffering of our ancestors, to earn the respect of future generations, and, and, to be willing, and to be willing to be transformed in the service of the work. No, thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. And you give so many words. Like, I feel your coaching <laughs> self and spirit in the way that you move. One, one thing that I keep posting, I've been posting for months, is this thing that, that you have said to non-Black folks 
you have to love black people more than you hate the state. I'm like, yes, there's different levels to this work. Get on it, get on it, right? So as we wrap up, because we're at six, um, could you talk about some of the organizers who have inspired you where you've been like, they do that so artfully. <laughs> I want to do that. And organizers from all types of spaces. You know, organizers are incarcerated, are in their neighborhoods, or moms um, at home in their community. So not everybody is a paid organizer. So all of the kinds of organizers that you can think about and name and lift up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ivana, if you like to start. I'm, I'm down, sure. Um, huh. So there's just so many folks. It's really hard to, to, to narrow this down, have so much love and respect for so many folks. But I have to first give love to my grandmother, Mabel Haley, Rifle toting, flat foot singing, black southern country woman who taught me everything. She taught me so much, and her spirit continues to live on through me. And so, I say yo to her, bye. And um, I would also very much have to say, you know, as a movement singer, you know, I, I feel like that is something that is very important to me as a leader. As I'm a creative leader, I am a singer. I'm a curator and that's just how I lead. And so there are people that I really look to in that particular fashion, like Wendy O'Neill, we've already talked about her. Um, Latasha Brown, who's another singing sister with me. I love singing with her whenever I can. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are some of the folks that I look to, I lean to. Um, I've been very much a, a student sitting at her feet, even though she probably don't know it, <laughs> of folks like Bernice Reagan Johnson. Um, and another powerful sister, her name is Gina Breelove. She does work around sound healing um, and bring them into the world. And so, yeah, these are people that I lean on, teachings I lean on, um, and folks I just love to get inspired by. Those are just a few to name a few. Um, for me, so many people as well. Um, but I'm just gonna give two, um, I'm gonna just shout out the first organizer that I knew, which is my great aunt Hazel Lee, black queer woman in the South, uh, who, you know, uh, was, you know, queer as fuck back in <laughs> the 50s and 60s, you know, between Alabama and New York and Detroit, just traveling and, uh, and like spreading all that queer magic and joy everywhere. And, um, so um, my auntie who's still with me today, so blessed to have her. Also, she taught me uh, the importance of reading um, and just my, you know, Dr. Seuss, I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> but I would never forget um, just, you know, how that um, understanding of like, reading to understand and to like, and then to ask questions and to challenge people and to challenge yourself is like, um, it's just what I live. Um, and then uh, Miss Whitney Houston, nifty. Oh, organizing the world with that voice, baby, um, is like my all time, um, she's a vocalist, but um, there was just a moment where, you know, those artists, they understood, um, it was like their pain led them to organizing in a way, like her and Michael and Diana Ross, they talked about love in such a way and sang about it, um, like in such a way, Aretha Franklin, oh, honey, uh, Tina Turner. I mean, just thinking about the ways in which people, uh, uh, R&B music, um, rhythm and blues that um, organizes people's pain um, and their grief, gospel music, you know, and their grief to like, to move through things, um, always inspired by black voices um, and entertainment. Mary. Yeah. Um, let's see, I think um, I, 
I, de- I certainly um, have been um, immensely, immensely blessed by the work, the skill, the artistry of Kaila Mungabaro. Uh, she was on staff, came on the staff um, around the same time I did. And her job was to whip, <laughs> whip me and the, the bunch of us little, um, you know, newbies into shape. And she poured so much. She poured so much into us. And she also helped us to begin articulating our abolitionist politic and begin calling the question on many things. And also was just like, taught me how to be rigorous. Like, you be rigorous in the work. You know, um, <laughs> I remember she would like, so you out there, you doing outreach, you talking to somebody, you trying to convince them to do X, Y, Z. She had me role playing. And I'd be like, you know, she's like, nope, ain't good enough. Nope, uh-uh, that don't make sense. And I remember one time I was just like in tears, like, I don't know, you know, but, um, and it was always in such a loving, a loving way. And also I think she was getting, um, you know, it's prepared for the political moment that we didn't even know that was gonna be happening um, after, you know, years in. Um, and I've learned a lot from my comrade, Kate Shapiro. We've been like, buddies in the work for a long time. And so we've taught each other a lot and she taught me a great deal. Um, particularly around like coordinating like hard skills. I also um, am a, like, am always amazed by the work that was done. Um, 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 Hollis Watkins, who was a um, young person inside of SNCC and one of the founders of Southern Echo, uh, who I think has, you know, his book is incredible. If folk, uh, San, the Sankofa of a Movement is the name of his book. And I've just um, just been so, I've, I've been able to sit at his feet. I've been able to sing freedom songs with him, but also just like his, his methodology and the slow, steady, respectful work of organizing that gets the goods. That there, um, I'm just like, Yo, you got he got mad game, yo. He got good he got good organizing game. And there's yeah, so 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 many. And I would say like, um, I would be remiss if I didn't name like, you know, all the folk who encompass the song family, the Kara Pages who, you know, have taught me so much, the Paulina, the Breed Loves, the Mandy Carters, um, I mean, um, Mama Ruby Sales, also a SNCC elder, that, you know, May, uh, she called me in the middle of the night, Mary, I got a word for you, you know? Um, but just like, this has a long history of doing work. And so gives me a lot of inf- inspiration about, you know, just time in the game and what it means to like, to stay in it, to make a, a commitment of your life, you know, and to be able to do it in a way that also, you know, um, where it doesn't be all consuming of your life, um, which is always a, a tough balance. but. Um, yeah, there's so many. There's so, so many. Asha Ramsby, badass young organizer out of Chicago, came up through uh, BYP 100 and other formations. But there's so, so many. There's so, so many. Um, God damn it, that Tony fucking Michelle. <laughs> my God, my God, that woman right there, Lord have mercy. That woman built a call out. I'm coming. Period. Period. Um, and yeah, there's so many. There's so many. Mm. I feel that. Right here. Lift everybody up. I feel that. Before we um, start to talk to our viewers, they have some questions. I wanted you to all talk about some campaigns that new folks might not know about and people who um, want to get reconnected to movement work um, can be a can join in. So what invitation are you putting out there for people for um, song, for Snapco, for Sister Song? How can people connect with you and where? Ooh. Um, well, I think it's really uh, exciting to one that all three of us is on this call um, because um, a few weeks ago we, um, we decided to form an In Defense of Black Lives Coalition here in Atlanta to advance the demand to defund the police. We're coming after that bag, period. And so um, over the last few weeks, we've been um, part of um, the Freedom Summer Project, which has been a six week organizing project 
um, and we have about 20 fellows here in Atlanta that have been hitting the streets, getting petitions, talking to people. Um, and tomorrow there's actually going to be a early vote camp, uh, caravan um, that starts at four o'clock that folks can meet at the Mall of West End um, because we know that voting is one of many tactics that we must engage in this particular um, um, uh, runoff is means a lot for our people means a lot for our people um and so yeah we want to invite folks to come four o'clock west end mall parking lot let's go do it early voting and i think um you know for folks who want to continue to um engage and learn more about the happenings of uh inside this coalition we just kicked off our social media it's a uh, infrabl atl or atlanta i believe I'll be mixing stuff up. Um, but folks can check it out on the IG. Or if not, you know, you can certainly look at any of our organizations, um, Instagram, um, Song Atlanta, Ignite Kindred, um, to get more information. And um, yeah, I'll stop there because I could start rattling shit. But yeah, that's tomorrow, friends. And then, oh, I just want to also name two on two, uh, Thursday at 7 o'clock. We're going to go um, on IG Live and do um, a teaching about defund and demystifying this for many people who are like, I don't understand. Let's get real clear. So we'll have a teaching. And um, folks should also, last thing I'll say, last thing I'll say is that folks should, uh, who are interested, um, we're holding an all-black uh, mass training that will happen uh, April 22nd and 23rd. Um, it's a mass training on defunding the police and abolition. Um, and so, yeah, if folks want to know more details about that, just continue to follow us on Instagram. August. Yes, August. What I say? April. Lord have mercy. See? Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Get me together. Yeah. August 22nd and 23rd, Saturday and Sunday. Um, 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 oh yeah, I, I mean I can go. Um, so there's a lot going on um, in all the places, and a couple of things that you all can get connected to in terms of reproductive justice work. <clears throat> Excuse me, my allergies are killing me today, y'all. My bad. Um, one, we are currently um, doing a birth justice fund um, that has been giving practical support to families on in need on the front lines. I'm sorry, y'all. <clears throat> this allergy thing is wild. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but that birth justice fund you can find on Sister Song's um, social media, uh, all the things, Sister Song underscore WOC. Um, but you can contribute to that. We have given out over $70,000 so far um, to families in need, ranging from just getting the practical needs they need for their families to providing housing, whatever they need to make sure that families are taken care of during this time. So that's something that we are constantly moving and constantly pushing forward. We're also doing a deep survey of birth workers across the Southern region in the states that we are doing a lot of our primary work in Georgia, um, Kentucky, and North Carolina. Um, so please, if you know birth workers, if you are a birth worker um, and you want to be connected to that network, we're trying to make sure that we are giving access to those folks who are in need um, services. So please make sure you follow our channels to be able to connect to that survey and to be able to add yourself and those you may know to that network. Um, we are also in the spirit of Black August um, and connecting to all the amazing political education that's going on all over the place. We're doing um, an RJ Summer Institute, um, August 10th through the 14th. Um, this is a primer on reproductive justice. You can understand more about the history of the work, um, how it works across all social justice movements, its intersections with all these really, really dope pieces of work that we got going on. It's going to be a fantastic week. Um, and it's ending in a concert too. So I'm just like, it's a lot of good stuff going on there. You can also find out more about how to get linked into that um, week of action and week of political education, again, the 10th to the 14th of August. So big things popping off, really excited about all the things. Yay, um, yeah. that is exciting. Um, 
And for Snapco, um, Mary named what we focus on right now, which is defund the motherfucking police. Um, our offering, period, right? Um, our offering is a research project and um, research and survey around Black folks' is, um, this this myst- the mystifying, um, uh, you know, the contradictions of again that how we are visioning and reimagining safety for ourselves. Um, So it's a survey for folks in Atlanta to really, again, just think about how Black folks are thinking about reimagining public safety and their understanding of DEFUND and what is it going to take, again, for us to be in movement together. Um, So we're launching that survey on August 10th, and you can go to our website. Um, If you live in Atlanta um, or any of the metro areas, uh, you are able to take that interview, um, take that survey and even talk about any experiences that you have with APD, um, DeKalb County, Cobb County um, Police Department surrounding um, the city of Atlanta. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that we also have a fund called the Taking Care of Our Own Fund uh, that we service Black trans and queer folks in Atlanta who need support. So whether it's emergency bail, emergency housing, cell phones for our babies and youth that we come in contact with during like hotel outreach and uh, street outreach, um, uh, food, uh, masks, any other things that folks are um, are in need and uh, support of. We're uh, offering micro grants currently to Black trans folks. You can also find that link to apply um, and also to donate um, at our website at www.snap the number four freedom dot org. Um, uh, and we're having if you just want to figure out like how to get involved in the work um, and coming through SNAPCO and you have a, a commitment to protecting Black trans lives um, and investing in it, you can join our membership. We are having um, a membership info session on August uh, the 12th, uh, which I believe is next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Again, if you want to join in um, and get into the work and support and Black trans folks in Atlanta, um, we would love to have you at our member uh, member info session next week um yeah that's what we doing deep on the police it's coming for that bag exactly um so folks i cannot see the chat so actually the moderator is texting me your questions we have time for probably two so monica mary tony michelle jump in anybody can take these and you all don't have to respond but this is a good one um, about entering, um, I guess, new movement spaces. This person asks, I find that it is difficult for activists, even while meaning people, to let go, allow others, newcomers, to take ownership of the work. How have you all met that challenge? I think, I think, um I think that there is a, when I think about organizing and I think about you build trust through the doing of the work, right? And I think sometimes there's one like an assumption that because somebody come in new, like you, I'll use analogy of a house. Somebody, you somebody come in new and they come into your house, ain't paid no bills, ain't, you know what I mean? They'll live there, but they just came in and then want to rearrange the furniture on first get up. No, baby, sit down, catch the vibe. See what we're doing, contribute, lend a hand, take on a task. You know what I mean? And build that, build, um, be able to build one the trust because we know people come in and out of the work. That's the nature of it, unfortunately. But I think it's also about, you know, when people come into work, I've always been taught like coming in with like your hands, what is like, let me be of service. And um, and it is through the doing and showing up that people like, yo. All right, you're not playing games. You're here for real. You also see this as sacred. And then, of course, like, like now here, like, this is like, hold this down. You know what I mean? Like, um, and giving folk um, the opportunity to show and take leadership of, of um, uh, you know, on the work that we're doing. And so I think that, you know, that's always, and it's always a fine balance. It's always a fine balance, you know? Um, and I think that, but there is also like, I think, um, 
a level of, particularly for folks like myself, I've been here for a while. So, you know, I'm like, I'm an opinionated motherfucker. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know a lot, I have a lot of historical memory, you know? Um, and so, but I think sometimes, um, even in myself, there are times where I'm like, you know, Hooks, step back. Mm-hmm. Step back, killer. Step back, like Monica was saying. And like, have to like, um, and not stand back and watch something implode. Not that, because that's that's liberal and irresponsible. But allow folks to be like, yo, you want to test some stuff out? Cool, do it. You know what I mean? Let me make sure you got what you need to like try some stuff, to do whatever. Like, you know what I'm saying? And be there to support and like, and to like be there ready to clap when the shit fucking works and also be there to like support when it didn't go so well and be like, but it's all good. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, this is part of the organizing is being able to be in experimentation, you know what I mean? And, and be able to make the calls and support the calls that again, ain't going to burn down the house, but allows for, um, you know, folk who have shown a level of commitment, you know what I mean? To, to take ownership. Monica, you coming? No, I was just unmuting. I wanted to see what the other question was. Like, get that out there because you said you had two. This is another, this is a better one. I like this one. Um, this person asks, can you talk about the role that Atlanta organizing plays in setting a pace and direction for national movements? Mm. No. You know, I've, I've lived in the South my entire life, you know, um, from the country of North Carolina to moving here now 10 years ago this year. And I think that Atlanta is known um, it has its own kind of history of civil rights and like this very, you know, <laughs> there's a way that certain black folks look at Atlanta like being <laughs> this, you know, epitome of civil rights and know everybody got their suits on and you know, all that kind of good jazz, right? But at the end of the day, it is a social justice hub in this country, it just truly is. And some of the most revolutionary, liberatory, amazing work is going down in this city. And, um, and people look to us, um, to be quite honest, a- in terms of like how we are organizing, how we're coming together across and building coalitions, and they model themselves after that. And I think that, you know, the bigger saying is like, you know, as the South goes, so does the rest of the country. And I truly believe that. Um, and I think about Atlanta being like a very important um point of data point in that, right? Um, just with us having such a concentrated, you know, uh, social justice community here, um, which I think is just really powerful. I really do. And I think that, I mean, it doesn't make us, you know, the, the, the place that knows all the things because people are doing dope ass work everywhere. But I do think that it, it, we have a unique experience here in Atlanta that um, that is worth paying attention to and being in alignment with because I think we found really powerful ways of like building really, really dope ass um, coalitions with each other. When I think about the work of Repro in particular in the in the ecosystem of all of this, there we have the the largest number of reproductive justice organizations in this city. Mad love to all my folks: Women's Women's Health Center, Art Southeast, uh, Spark. You know, Women Engage. Like, I mean, we're we're we go strong in the city for reproductive justice. And when I think about like the wins and things that we've been able to accomplish in this city, right? They people are modeling their work after that, like us winning the case that we did against Kemp, you know, in terms of this abortion ban and like all of that, like we have a track record of like when we come together in this city and we bring all of our power together, we win. We absolutely do. And so, um, yeah, I just think that we just continue to create different models around that, whether it's across our different social justice movements or whether we're doing all that work collectively to defund the police and all the other things that we're doing, that we have a track record of like having really strong, powerful collaborations that are built on trust. And I think that goes back to the first question, right? Because everybody wants to get in right now, which is dope and amazing. But I think that what this community that I have the blessings of being able to be a part of is that we built enough, you know, connection with each other to build deep trust so that we can move with each other in a way that actually is sustainable. So that's what I would say to that. Sorry, Michelle, you want to um, drop any 
wisdom chime in? No, I don't have anything to drop in there. <laughs> I feel good. Come on, Atlanta. Unless anyone wants to leave us with some parting words for the folks, I would like to conclude. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for making yourselves available to talk to folks. We encourage you. You've heard the invitation. Come join the work, right? Build some trust, love up on people. We thank you for being with us. Take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. Thank you so much. Great moderating. Yes, thank you too. Good job. Good job. Good job, good job. You know you did a good job, so say you did a good job. Good job, good job. Hey, good job, good job. Love y'all. I love y'all. Bye.